buddy. Uh, I'll ask you what literally everybody wants me to ask you, which is, from your perspective, what happened with MJF this weekend? I'm not going to comment on that, uh, but I've got a lot of stuff on the pay-per-view I can comment on, but I'm not going to comment on it. All right, well, then I'll follow up with something maybe you will comment on, is, as Punk alluded to, uh, it's a sort of longer-than-average show. I had a lot of people hitting me up saying they felt fatigued, especially on the East Coast where the show it did after midnight. Is this the kind of length of show you're going to continue to put out? I will follow the feedback of the fans. It was pretty similar. Revolution had a great response, and commercially the show was very successful. Like I said before uh, Chris came in, I was starting to say, there was, it was a little bit different, and I ended up uh, adding a little bit to the length of the show to help the show commercially and help the show make money. And I think it made, uh, if not a seven-figure difference, definitely a six-figure difference in the bottom line of the show. And so that's a big consideration, certainly, and a major financial consideration when Game 7, like I said, it was probably only a 28% chance of the Game 7. It was far more likely if I'd booked the show Saturday that there would have been a game and it would have been the Warriors who were a big draw. And uh, so the Game 7 only happens 28.1% of the time. 72% of the time, this would have been a pretty easy thing. And on the West Coast, I probably would have ended it around the time they always end. Every pay-per-view's ended between the same time until tonight. They've all ended, we've had a lot of the best pay-per-views anybody's done, they've all ended between uh, 11.40 and 11.55-ish, on 11, maybe 11, between 11.40 and 11.56, seven, uh, on the East Coast, which is like 8.40 today. So this is about the same amount of wrestling bell to bell as the revolution. The difference is, I was starting to say, Layla and Chris Statlander had a long, great match before Layla got hurt uh, on the first match of the buy-in in Orlando, which was on the East Coast for the fans. And I think, I thought the fans were far more, uh, like, I, like from that I learned, probably better to put the stuff in the pay-per-view. I thought the crowd, this was the best, if people were fatigued at home, I'm sorry, because I never intended it to be that way, but it was the best the fans in the arena have ever reacted for the last three matches of any pay-per-view we've ever done, Nick. And I've done... 13 of them now, and plus the original Fight for the Fallen Fighter Fest, which were free, but um, they were free domestically. I think they were still international pay-per-views, but I think overall international gets a good deal on pay-per-view prices. So uh, I think um, domestically, this was again the highest we've ever done for Double or Nothing. So as I saw it go, it was getting more and more likely that it was going to go seven games, which again is very unlikely. Not very unlikely, less than you know, 28, 28.1% historically, exactly. And so as it was getting, it was tied 2-2, I'm watching, the, obviously we, we did really well. If anybody followed the Wednesday ratings, I was really happy with the go-home show in qual terms of the quality of the wrestling. I thought the wrestling was excellent. I really loved the Samoa Joe versus Kyle O'Reilly main event and the three-way match with Swerve, when we get in the win, probably his biggest win to date. It's a big match on Dynamite with Jungle Boy and, uh, uh, and Spricky Starks and I thought that it was very clear the basketball game with those guys had a big impact on the, the rating because we were over a million for the first hour P2, and, it, and, and about four, seven, over 475 for the first hour. Then it was like, I don't know, 880 in the second hour. It was over a million in the first, so it was a huge drop but, uh, because of the basketball, but still overall the show did a really good number. It was up week over week, and a .35 is a huge number to pull with what we were up against. We were a top 10 show on television right now, not cable, a top 10 show on all of television. Dynamite with the competition it was up against. I mean, everyone was up against that competition, and it did really well for Warner Brothers Discovery, which had like six of the top ten shows on Wednesday. And oh, I'm sorry, that's not true. ESPN had big coverage. I think Warner Brothers Discovery had four of the top ten shows. ESPN also did well. We beat every show on ABC, every show on Fox, every show on CBS except Survivor. And NBC has that power block with the Chicago shows, the Chicago Med and the Chicago PD and the Chicago Fire. Those, those did real well. We were top 10 on all of television beating broadcast TV now. That's a huge deal for us. And that was and against big sports competition. So there was clear, though, from seeing the way the first hour moved, that like, it's going to swing our fans. I see evidence that we had, by putting the hot three matches on at the end, a lot of interest in the show. And it drove, not only were they the hottest, like I said before, to, not to belabor it, the hottest the crowd's ever been for the last three matches of any pay-per-view we've ever done. So I felt really good about that. People at home, I mean, look, I am a big, I had dinner with Dana out here. I think I may have met, noted to people uh, while I was out here. And uh, with my dad, and we were talking about it. It's a great business strategy for them too. Punk and Hangman went into the ring before any UFC main event you'll ever see. And they do pretty well. They do great numbers. They're the biggest pay-per-view company in the world. And they do a great job. They've had, they have similar number of fights as we did matches, actually more. You'll see like 15 prelims, like 15 matches on a UFC card. Why? For a lot of reasons. They have a lot of fighters that people are interested in. It drives engagement. It drives betting. It gives people more time to buy the show, builds more word of mouth for a main event. And 
hey, on a Saturday, guess what? Like, it's no secret I'm in the football business. I, for my career, have to watch football on Saturdays. So are you trying to move in kind of a UFC style direction? Is Are you trying to kind of... No, this, I, like I said, I'll see what the feedback to this okay. was. This was a unique circumstance. I was flexible with a window. It's a good chance that we would have ended at the same time we always do. If I hadn't had to add to the card to make sure there was a whole, almost like, look, those la the whole pay-per-view was great. But it was, a, it was one more match than Revolution, Bell to start to finish if you had the buy-in. There were 12 matches on the Revolution. There were 13 matches tonight, including the buy-in. There were 12, it was nine plus three on Revolution. It was 12 plus one tonight. So it was one more, bell to bell, I might, it might have been, I think it was very similar start to finish in terms of the action. And it was on the West Coast, which I think makes it make more sense. So like I said, for these people in Vegas who come to the fights and also people from all over the world, but in Vegas, in this building, they never see a world title fight before we got to the match. And they, have, they start earlier with more fights. I think, I'm not saying, I'm, look, if a UFC model is a very successful model. We're obviously totally different sports. Yeah, but, say, yeah. but I have a ton of respect for what they do in pay-per-view. And that's why one of the reasons why I've loved to not, uh, they're the 800 pound gorilla of this business and I stay out of their way. And also Dana's my friend and he's been so, 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 so cool to me. So like, uh, I take great pride in their success and also like being here in their home building in their hometown and like I, it's like I you know this is his territory so I wanted to see him with my dad and hang out with him while I was here but like he was telling me it was worked great for their business too I was telling him I bet now because game seven was looking very it was it was Thursday night we had dinner so I didn't know there was there was game six hadn't been played yet but I was telling him I was like and you know they have these things all the time they have big sporting events on Saturday nights college football's huge and you know same as same as me they're rooting against the game going to overtime and tonight I think it was a four point game. So we had, you know, Shivani push when the game ended, not saying about the basketball exactly, but saying like, hey, there's a lot, there's people at home. If you haven't been watching, this has been a great pay-per-view, which there's been a lot of great stuff already. And it's, there's so much stuff to go. And when our anarchy in the arena was going off and the crowd was the hottest they had been at the entire point of the night and the basketball game's over, that's a good ad for people to like, hey, you might want to like flip this on. There's a lot of people watching with their families or with their friends, gatherings now are back. People are hanging out in their homes more. So it's a great reason, hey, the game's over. If you get one wrestling, I've been that wrestling fan, right? I've been that fan at like watching, uh, hey, was the Royal Rumble 2003 on during the football championship games? It was, right? Anybody? I think that. I'm pretty sure it was. I remember watching the, the matches, like the Kurt Angle match, and uh, I'm pretty sure the football games were on that night. And that's like literally the biggest, the second and third highest watched TV shows of the entire year after the Super Bowl. So um, I was in that game. We were in the, the Jaguars. <laughs> were actually the number two show of the year in uh, that year. Most second most watched show of the year. So like, look, like uh, there's, it, it's, I thought it came out incredibly well. I'm sorry for the long winded answer, but it was a crazy week for many reasons and for the length of the show. It was shorter than WrestleMania 31, I believe, which is a great show other than the Sting stuff, I think is one of their best shows. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, besides that, that part uh, is a great show and it was significantly longer than what we did tonight, especially with the stuff at the beginning. He's pointing and nodding. You were right, it's the same It was. January night, it was the same day. Yeah, they were up against, so I remember watching the championship, which is obviously a big part of my life now, 2003 Royal Rumble. So like a lot of big events, it happens, but we actually fought through, this is a big win. We did our record gate. We did the record for double or nothing, again, Euro, for the every time. And uh, it, was, it was a big success, and for the crowd, that's why I put those three matches at the end, knowing that the crowd would be the hottest they've been. And we got the hottest crowd, I think for people at home, Look, like that was one of the things Dana said that really uh, got through to me. Is like if stuff what you're doing is working, keep doing it, and like ignore or, like some of the noise if it's working because like you're gonna get people that don't like what you're doing no matter how well it's doing. And I think, look, that being said, I don't plan to always go this late. I think it was a unique circumstance, but I left us the flexibility. We could have ended like we have every other time by 11:40 to 11:58 on the West Coast, which would have been 8:40, and it would have been about 40 minutes earlier than we actually did end. But I added about 40 minutes into the show, and I, like I said, I think it paid off at a tune of six to seven figures. Okay. Thanks. Will Washington. Hey, Will. Michael and Graf City. How you doing, Tony? Great, Will. Thanks. How are uh, you? I'm pretty good. Great. I don't really have much of a voice, I've been doing a lot of screaming. So, uh, You've had a big week. Yeah, I have. Uh, <laughs> really big. Well, you've been traveling? And I know, I have been back and forth. You went forth. back and forth? I've been back and you forth. You got to see your cousin win a high-profile match on uh, television? Yes, that was great. That was the whole reason I came. Um, so, speaking of which, uh, I have been to a lot of AEW shows. I'm pretty sure this is like my 13th. Um, and one of the things I have uh, noticed is, I, I pay attention to the crowds. And this crowd in particular, for all the pay-per-views I've been at, was 
the hottest I had ever seen it in the final stretch. Um, especially once the arcade and er, arcade uh, arena. arena, 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 arena. I, knew, I warned the guys. That was the one thing I said might happen is somebody would do what you just did. But anarchy in the arena. <laughs> anarchy in the arena, right? We've used anarchy twice. Okay. Um, <laughs> yep. So with that said, this was only the second pay per view that AEW's ever had in the Pacific Time Zone. Um, so knowing that going forward do you see um or is this a better question for Raphael? um well no Raphael and i literally talk every day about the booking so um, it's a question for the two of us we're the ones that do it uh, so do you foresee um especially with talking about the length of these pay-per-views and how um you know that you were talking about how you were comfortable going along with this one do you foresee doing more shows specifically pay-per-views out Closer to the I, I do think if the comp competition was right, I would maybe have had you know the buy-in, maybe the length, one match less on the night, maybe one more on the buy-in, one maybe two less on the pay-per-view, change things. I could have moved things around had uh, you know things not gone this way with the timing. But it is nice to have the flexibility. Also, we just want to service the fans all across the country. I think we've been all over and done pay-per-views all over the country. I think there's a lot of great places to do uh, pay-per-views on the West Coast. We're just now bringing the TV to LA this week, which is a huge, obviously a good thing for me to plug and talk about now with Dynamite for the first time and Rampage coming to California. And I think now that we're finally doing Dynamite and Rampage out on the West Coast also, and of course Double or Nothing bringing it back here, which I think now, uh, like I said on Wednesday and Friday, I didn't spend any time with Lila. I wasn't planning to go out at all. Martha asked me to go out with her, uh, Dr. Martha Hart. I was not planning to go out. She asked me, I wouldn't have taken up. I told her it's her moment and that's why I got the heck out of there after uh, she, I did walk her out as she asked, and then I thought she was doing great, and she was out there with uh, two great ones, and uh, you know. But I wasn't expecting to go out at all. But I had said on Wednesday and Friday, double or nothing, staying in Vegas forever, and I think they showed why. They, uh, it's great to be back, and there's great markets on the West Coast, uh, and the Mountain Time Zone too, as you know, as a Mountain Time Zone guy from Denver. Uh, so like there's, <laughs> yeah, and that was one of the last dynamites before the pan uh, the. Pan the Pandemic shutdown. It was the second to last show. It was actually the show after our best pay per view to, at that point, probably to date, was Revolution 2020. And tonight was a, the same kind of hot crowd, hot mind. I was really proud of it. So it was a longer show, but again, it was shorter than a lot of WrestleManias and Wrestle Kingdoms. So I, you know, I, I do think like we get held to a very high standard, which is a, overall a good thing uh, in sports, as I've seen. Uh, better than not than not being held to a high standard, as I know from some experience in football in uh, America and uh, at times in Europe. But right now, things are. Uh, probably never been in a better position with Fulham than we are right now. Um, I, I know this is something you probably think about all the time. And this is related to the crowd, which was great. But in WWE, there's a sheet that says, baby faces, heels. And if you say, I want two heels to wrestle each other on Raw, you're going to say, How do you know that, Dave? Tell everyone. I'm not. <laughs> Because I worked there. God, this is a What did you do there? I was a writer. Oh, okay. It was embarrassing. Uh, anyway. <laughs> no, wow, well, oh, geez, why is that embarrassing? It's a, you know, hey man, I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm not trying to be a dick. No, working in wrestling is a great thing, and that's a great and that's a great place to work in wrestling. So. Sure, sure, yes, it's, it's great. Um, but the question is, <laughs> so, the question is, you do this a lot, and this main event was two baby faces, two of the most popular wrestlers. And were you ever worried that when they went out there, there would be maybe not good tension, but like negative, like weird, like, oh, this, this person, maybe this is not good for them and, and their character going forward. You ever feel like that's, that conflict, that, that special tension that you need in a wrestling match isn't there if you have two people that are kind of the same alignment? They're very different wrestlers, right. and they have very different backgrounds, and have had very different paths to get here. So I thought that uh, even though neither one of them is like a traditional rule-breaking wrestler, yeah. you know, there a lot of times uh, they say styles make fights. I thought they would have a great match, and I also thought, look, the sanctity of the championship is very important. Like, we've had four champions until tonight, now we have our fifth champion, and every one of them is somebody the company can hang their hat on as a face of the company, and that includes Hangman, who was excellent. And look at all the great matches. And I know I said this to a bunch of you in the build-up, too, and in interviews, but what a great champion Hangman has been for the company. And it was something I felt really strongly about, and it's something I believe in. And, and you know, look, I'll tell you the truth. When, uh, when he took some time away from the company a year ago, I don't think a lot of people in my position would have held, held things for him the way I did and, and made sure that... He still got a world title shot when he got back and put him in a position where he go in the casino ladder match, give him the opportunity as a joker to go in and then earn a world title shot after he had 
not been around and uh, and could have gone with people that were more experienced, but I believed in him and that's he's hangman is a guy we've been lined up in from the beginning and I'm a loyal person and he's a loyal person and he's a great wrestler and from the very beginning of the company the story when we were out here was it was hangman and then it was Jericho and then of course Mox and Kenny at the end and we're the first four world champions well we set up for Jericho Mox took the title from him and Kenny which was the end of the show and the beginning of the show as we set up going into it was we knew out coming into the show was hangman was going to wrestle whoever wins the main event it's either going to be his, his kind of they weren't partners yet but his stable mate uh kenny which would set up more later but uh, so the four we really believe in these four wrestlers and i thought that this was the perfect main event for the fans a match that was a must see it was like Punk said when he was sitting in this chair before uh, they asked me to move over, uh, which I was going to leave uh, the, the the aura of this chair that uh, you know CM Punk and Jade and Chris had sat in. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Uh, I think you were proven right about the match. I agree. The thank you. The crowd certainly said. There were I, there were people that didn't thank you. I really appreciate yeah. you saying that because there were people that like thought that it might not make as my and I was said from the beginning it would and that for the prestige of the title it was actually very important and the I guess now is as good a time as any to point out that like I didn't and I talk about hangman and this comes full circle around the time he left was around the time punk came in and a bunch of people said you should put the belt on punk as soon as he gets in especially when hangman wasn't there to wrestle Kenny it all out and uh, the reason he was not there is a very legitimate reason it was a great reason I'm very happy for hangman and his, his family and at the time, uh, that was his private matter, and I think it was great that they what they've done and, and had a family. And then he came back and uh, beat Kenny in the payoff of what's you know the old, the longest standing story in this company still. And they have had one of the best matches, if not the single best match in the history of the company, with the four with Hangman and Kenny and the Young Bucks. And at Revolution 2020 again, I always go back to it. It's a special night, and uh, I think. Uh, Dave, it was the right match, and it just, I, you're, I appreciate you saying that because I do feel like it was proven right as I was, I was pointing to somebody in the back because I smiled to him because I told him it was the crowd was going to, uh, and, and if people, a bunch of people worried about the length of the show, and I told him commercially this is something that is going to be very good for the bottom line of the company, and I promise that the, hot, the crowd will be hotter than ever, and, and with what we have at the end, it's going to be great. And I thought, you know, between the Anarchy in the Arena and the World Title Match, the World Tag Title Match was a great, perfect match to go in between. And uh, Hangman, whether it was a Kenny winning the title from Kenny, the first 60 minute draw on live television in my lifetime, I don't know of one. I think Bachwinkle Hennig was taped, Dave, right? So. Bachwinkle and Hennig did a tape match. Yeah. yeah, so there's no live 60 minutes in the modern. I carry Von Eric and Ric Flair on the Financial News Network was taped in Hawaii. Oh, that was taped weeks before that, yeah. yeah. So there's no live 60 minute Broadways? Um, I mean, there was, there was Iron, Man Iron Man matches, but no, not Iron Man matches. Like actual, like one, one fall. One, have there been a one fall 60 minute time limit drawn left? I don't think so. But that wasn't a one hour Broadway. Okay, it was close. They did. Hey, that was a great match. That was a great match. But that was that tape delay. Wasn't that from England? That was also tape delay. Yes, and that was two. But that was two out of three falls. So one fall, 60 minute Broadway. It's the only live television in the modern. We've caught, we've and we've gone through a lot, and we went through a lot of stuff just now. What's up, Dave? What was the last thing you said? Oh, in Japan town. Oh, but yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, in America, yes, domestically. Domestically, the first, so Hangman and, and Danielson, and then the match they had to kick off the TBS era. Like, Hangman was the champion that brought us into TBS, which is like really meaningful and important, and that'll never be forgotten. The Hangman-Danielson match on January 4th was a huge success for us. Was it January 4th or 5th? 5th, thank you, thank you. I was thinking January 4th in the brain. Thanks, Raf, good job. Uh, January 5th, uh, I knew I caught myself there. Um, yeah, on January 5th when we started the TBS era, the uh, Hangman Danielson will always be a huge part of it. And then the matches with Adam Cole, who again, uh, what a way, uh, Adam Cole, what a great moment with Adam Cole and Britt and Martha Hart, I thought, and Adam Cole, great matches with Hangman. Uh, the Texas Death match was very special, and of course, Revolution. A lot of people, again, didn't think that at the end they would get the reaction and stuff. And Hangman and Cole got the crowd was as into it as anything. I think uh, you know up to for at least for, uh, for a while there, and it was it was uh, just an awesome match. And uh, Hangman's been tremendous. Takeshita, great match with Takeshita. Uh, I think that was uh, unanimous. So Styles make fights, and we talked about the run Hangman's had, and we you know when Punk was in here, we talked about the run he's had, and it just felt like the right match. So thank you for. Uh, let me let me give you a, a long answer to your point, but just felt right. And as far as how they come together, 
I, I think uh, there's, you know, I hate to, I, to borrow a phrase from your former employer, Shades of Grey, right? And that's UFC, that's Pearl Resu, that's AEW. Hey, Tony, Stephanie Chase. Hey, Stephanie. Great. Um, so, with Omi and Honor for the past couple of months, how have you found juggling that with AEW as far as time management, everything else you do? Um, even so, sorting like the rosters of all the wrestlers you have, and then with it being now a pay-per-view month, plus you've got Forbidden Door coming up, is what has that been like? It's been the greatest uh, run we've had. I think it's, it was a crazy time. I've never been busier than I was through April and May, and now it's starting to actually like open up and, and light at the, tu at the end of the tunnel in a really positive way, but I'm also excited what's coming in the fall and winter. So uh, I'll come full circle back to AEW if I may. So, um, and Ring of Honor, both. Uh, first of all, before I go full circle, I'll start. Uh, Ring of Honor technically hasn't been a few months I've been the owner, actually. Uh, it just closed pretty recently. It was kind of a, a gutsy thing I did uh, on working off the interim agreement, but I was actually the interim booker for a while there because uh, I hadn't actually, Sinclair was still owning the company, but I had uh, uh, I'd taken over uh, financially and it was agreed that like everything was, it, it was really cool. They were really good to work with and I think I was like, I wanted, they wanted the Supercard of Honor to happen. I think it made sense if I was going to purchase the company that the Supercard of Honor would happen with me booking the show and running the show. And, then, and and taking the, since it's after the, the agreement, you know, but they were great. Sinclair was awesome with it. So I actually just closed pretty recently because they were awesome to work with, but it's a complicated asset transfer. I think sometimes like, you know, that's stuff, the outside of the business, uh, sometimes people that aren't in, in, the, in the business communication with all the uh, assets that were being transferred and there's a lot to document that we had made a deal. And it's a pretty uh, famous story because I uh, had not, I was not sure that, uh, it was actually going to close in time for the announcement in March in Daly's Place when we did the announcement of Ring of Honor. So uh, it was, it was uh, we worked off an interim agreement. So then we come back to that. As we close that, it was a really exciting time for AEW. The Supercard, going back to that and how busy I was around that time. We're getting ready for the NFL draft uh, at the start of April. Fulham is in a really exciting position at that time. It was looking increasingly likely that we would get the automatic promotion, but also we really wanted to win the, the football league championship, which we did. And so going in through April, it's always a crazy time for me with the NFL draft, especially I still do the same things I've been doing for many years where I like focus on the players that don't get drafted and try and use statistics to find some good undrafted players. And so that was a really busy time and we were coming back. I literally flew in from TV in Philadelphia. I came from Philadelphia where Doug Peterson was the head coach, the Jags head coach, and then I came back for the draft. I had been in Pittsburgh and then came back and I went to Philly and then came back right from Philly and I literally got in the morning of the first round and I'd been doing everything on the phone and Zoom and at the same time Fulham uh, was cruising. The Ring of Honor, we had just done the pay-per-view and I'm just really proud of the Ring of Honor pay-per-view and, and talk about pay-per-view link, you know, that was under three hours. It was like kept it to three hours. It's different. If that's really what people want from AEW, I, I'm open to it, okay? To give, if people want less for their $50, I'm open to doing it if that's really what people want. But I do think, look, a lot of commercially successful things, the Batman, I see people saying to Matt Reeves, like, you made a long Batman, but it's also the most commercially successful thing that Batman's done in a long time. So, so it's worked very well for us because we did record numbers and the crowd was hotter than they've been. So, you know, you do hear, but I, but again, you see that's the one thing people say about the Batman, right? Three hours. But you're, it, you're talking to me right now, but when you started... Well, you're the one who asked. I know, but when you started AEW, you said you didn't want to do these length of shows. You said you didn't want these WrestleMania length shows. That's what I'm wondering is if your strategy has just changed in the three years? Well, I've seen some, again, I've learned a lot and I've, and we've pay-per-view numbers have grown. And again, that's part of like on pay-per-view, I think we've grown as a pay-per-view. Every milestone we could hit, we've hit. Every pay-per-view year over year has gone up and we did it again tonight. And it was against probably the toughest competition for any double or nothing yet. With I don't think we've had to face a game seven playoff with two big teams. 10 years later, literally 10 years after the Heat and the Celtics went seven games, I was here when Manny Pacquiao left the crowd sitting. I sat for an hour waiting for something. And this crowd didn't sit waiting for shit. They had the hottest two lead up matches to a main event they ever had. And then they had the hottest main event. It was the hottest go home stretch of shows we ever done. Again, I like giving people a lot for their $50. The Ring of Honor pay-per-views are less money. So I do them a little, it's not, it's not, it's a great value the fan every bit as much, but we do a little bit, we charge a little bit less and we do a little bit less. I've only done one, but it was, uh, it was one of my favorite shows I've ever done. I'm really proud of it. And so going back to that, uh, I love doing that. And then since then, 
There's been the murder. What? Are you okay? Are you no, mad? Sorry, yeah, we were Mandy's shaking I'm, his I'm head. Gonna right. get Nick the mic next time. Sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. You're okay. Is everyone yeah, okay? I'm, no, I'm fine. I want. I was just re going I'm back to your question. Fine. I wanted to address you too. Oh, okay. I saw Mandy shaking. Oh, you're great. You did great. Uh, good. So, Steph. Uh, so, um, so going back to this because I, I really wanted. Uh, it's a long question. There's a lot. So if you want to know everything, I'll give you a long answer. So then, uh, going through. This merger uh, and the, now the new company we've come out of with Warner Brothers Discovery. Uh, that, that is a really exciting time for us too. It's a really exciting thing. And then even this week, like I, I was in, I did press from, and I was on Zoom with the manager and, and the CEO of Fulham and with Marco talking players all the days, get up uh, early for that. And then, uh, you know, uh, Jags were in camp. That's an exciting time. Get, the coaches are starting to evaluate players coming in. It's kind of a, a quiet time for me in football. I was just at the NFL owners meeting. So I came, I was at the NFL owners meeting in Atlanta talking about media rights and exciting things. I flew out here and, for TV. So I was at the NFL owners meeting Tuesday, came out here Tuesday night. Uh, we did TV Wednesday. Thursday morning, I was up at 5 a.m. and started doing radio on the East Coast at 5.55, and then I did it till noon. Then I took a shower quickly. No, wait, no, that's not true. I did the all-media call. I did, but between, I, I took a shower. Uh, I talked to a bunch of you on the all-media call, and then I went to LA, and I met with the new management of the company, and then headed out there, and it was the most exciting, exhilarating meeting I've ever had in my life, and I've never felt better about the future of the company and more safe about what's happening here. And I feel really good about the new Warner Brothers discovery to have such a strong management. Nancy Daniels is such a strong leader, and she was really cool. And so I flew out to LA and back to meet Nancy Daniels along with her team, and, and it was some, some familiar faces and also new faces, and it's really exciting. It was my first time at Discovery, and what a great thing we have. This is the future of everyone who works here and the fans, who it's really important because now I feel like there's a real discovery sees too how important it is to the wrestling fans to have wrestling on TBS and TNT because it was gone for too long and it's really cool that it's back. I think it means a lot to a lot of people. I know it does. And uh, so we have such great uh, management there and they encouraging. And I know there's so many things we can partner on. I'm really grateful for that. So that was probably one of the most important things going on. So it's a ton of stuff. And now the Ring of Honor is closed and I'm still, I, I think, there can be a future there, hopefully with a weekly Ring of Honor and also big events. Supercard was a huge success. It was many times over recent Ring of Honor pay-per-views, one of the biggest Ring of Honor pay-per-views ever. Uh, and yeah, so it's all really exciting stuff. And then football season's gonna start. Fulham's back in the Premier League. The Jags have a new head coach who's awesome. And I, I really love Doug and he's, he's, he's brought so much experience he won the Super Bowl if you don't if you if you I don't know if you're familiar with uh, uh, we come to uh, England a lot every year the Jaguars and uh, Doug we actually played Doug the Eagles um, in the year after they won the Super Bowl and the year after we lost in the AFC championship game they beat us and Doug uh, he's played in the NFL as, and he's played in the Super he's he's been on the he's been on the roster of a team that played in the Super Bowl and Doug's played in big games and he's a great coach so working with him is awesome so I'm really excited for football season both in the Premier League and in the NFL and really excited for the summer to come in wrestling. I mean, to go to the forum is a big deal for me. I'm like, I claim a lot of places as homes, like Ted DiBiase uh, when I was a kid. And he changes residence every quarter, but I do. I live in, uh, you know, a lot of the year in Jacksonville more, and I base out of there, but I travel 52 weeks a year every week for Dynamite. So I do, you know, 175, 200 flights a year when you include football for both continents. And uh, it's just 104 alone for Dynamites. And if I'm in Jacksonville, maybe twice a year, call it 100 just on Dynamites when you add in live rampages, pay-per-view specials, football, every, the, it's a lot. So uh, a lot goes into it, but I try to like manage the time and remember that like I'm responsible for a lot of people and I love every minute, like I'm doing, whatever I'm doing, I love it. Cause like to work in those businesses, it means a lot. So LA is one of, along with Jacksonville, Champaign, Illinois, Chicago, Illinois, and London, uh, I consider LA one of my big five homes, and I've never gotten to, to work with AEW doing a show out there before, but it's where AEW was actually formed. And I was just telling the new management this story because it was actually out there where I first had the conversation. It was in April 6th of 2018, uh, where I had a conversation out there that led uh, basically the launch of AEW, and it was uh, with my partner and activist artist management, Bernie Cahill. He dragged me out on a Friday night, and we it's a good chance we wouldn't be here if he hadn't. Um, and I saw the president of TNT and TBS at the time, and he was—he uh, was—he he took a chance on us that I'll never forget. And and then 
after the ratings were good initially, he took an even bigger chance on us and, and gave us the extension because the first deal didn't pay that great, but it was still an opportunity to go on TNT and TBS and it did pay something. And now uh, it pays fairly, I think, and they've done very right by us. And now we have a whole new management team that can get behind us in new exciting ways uh, with AEW. So that's a lot of stuff. I also have, there's a bunch of other companies I'm on the board of our own that I am not talking about here. Sport, True Media, Sports Analytics, uh, but the management team there does a great job running the day-to-day -day and other business ventures. Uh, I'm on committees in the NFL. I'm in the fan engagement and major events committee of the NFL. In March, I flew out for TV ahead of the Fort Myers TV. I had a meet, committee meeting in Palm Beach. I don't get much time to myself, so I was talking about Batman to Nick and how long Batman was. I landed in Monday night for a committee meeting in Palm Beach. Uh, Jonathan Kraft, the owner of the Patriots, is actually a big AEW fan, so he's, he runs the Fan Engagement and Major Events Committee, and he was nice enough to put me on it because I think we've shown that we do a good job engaging with the fans here and, and can add to the big events in the NFL, which are the biggest events in the world, and uh, the engagement with the fans, which I think you know we do a good job with, and, and Jonathan's one of the world's leading experts on that and data, and he's a big wrestling fan. Uh, when we did Mox versus Nagata in the summer of 21, I knew Jonathan Kraft was a big wrestling fan when he said to me, like, you got them coming on your territory. And he like, I was like, oh my God, you get Mox versus Nagata, the business of it. It's like, and at the time it was a business coup unto itself, what was happening in the world of wrestling. I got to lay the hammer down in a major goddamn way. So, uh, and uh, so it was, it's a, it's a lot, but um, I'm just, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. And. Does that, I mean, does that begin to answer it for you with the juggle? <laughs> yeah, kind it's of. It's like juggling. Yeah. <laughs> a lot, yeah. Great. Anyway. No, it's a great question. I hope it was a good answer, and, yeah, I, and yeah, hopefully yeah. it's a start. It's a start. Guys, just a few more questions, okay, Denise? Great. Okay. I, have a, I can take a few more, and I want to make sure anybody who came and stayed all this time gets to ask me whatever they want. Hey, Denise. Speaking uh, of the Ring of Honor Supercard pay-per-view, what a great host you were. Thank you so much for saying that. I'm very happy to hear that. Um, so my question for you is, given the fact that we had our first double or nothing here at, you know, in 2019, I was here for the show and so much has happened since then. So today, knowing everything that you guys have accomplished, all of the records and the people and the over $1 million and all of that. What over 1.1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1.1. It's a big, it's a big lot. It's 100,000. It is. It's a, it's a big difference. Yes, yes. So with all of that being said, if you can go back and tell your, you know, your 2019 double or nothing Tony Khan self, what advice would you tell yourself or what kind of, like, what would you go back and tell yourself during that time period? Trust your instincts going into the pandemic because what you're doing is safe. You're not going to let anybody get hurt. It's voluntary. Everybody wants to come. It's voluntary. The first week, March 18th, was like really hard and a bunch of people, like, I walked in my office and like every big star in all my office were in there and they were all pulling in different directions. And it was like, I was like, look, if you don't want to be here, it's six o'clock, the show goes live in two hours, you were in there. And I said, if you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here, but the show goes live in two hours. And I, the show I formatted, like, if anybody doesn't want to come, I'll change it, because I got time. But like, and it ended up being a huge success. I think like 950 ballpark watched it in the P2, and it did a huge number in the demo, one of the biggest we saw, and it was actually significantly up, and it did a huge number for the debut of the late, great Mr. Brody Lee and Matt Hardy. And it was supposed to be in Rochester in Brody's hometown, but we put together the best show we could and pushed forward. And now it's a historically important show in the history. And it started the pandemic and put the wrestlers around ringside. And it was a weird week for me uh, trying to figure out what to do in the pandemic. And I watched wrestling on Monday and when I didn't see the fans, uh, the wrestlers as fans, and when I didn't see the camera, the hard cam on the screen, I thought, OK, we got them. We got something here because I figured then they wouldn't between then and Wednesday, it wasn't going to change either. Uh, back when we had competition on Wednesdays. And I can I can tell you, I've never watched the competition uh, on a win, we've done a hundred shows head to head with other uh, wrestling competition. I've never watched one before, but I did have basketball on the side. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, uh, so it's a good, it's a good question. A lot changed, but I would say in the pandemic was the most important thing we did because we were on fire going into the pandemic. And I think like I had kind of around Christmas that year. That was the last time we had a week off. The last time was Christmas 2019. Which was, uh, you know, I think really said something to our new bosses that we were like, we'll work hard and commit. And I never, look, we uh, safety wise, we we had no issues. We had fans. We when we brought fans back, AEW was the first to bring fans back. Actually, even ahead of the Jaguars, and the Jaguars ended up using our our seat configuration, which then a lot of teams use with the 25% configuration we brought back. And there's different ways to do it. And I'm not saying that uh, the I, look like I and I get anytime I say something, I kind of can't. Live without, I can't, I, you know, 
there's different opinions about the Thunderdome, but I thought there were things about it. Like that's a way to go. That's a way to go. But if outdoors for us, we were outdoors, not indoors. So outdoors, I equated it, and a bunch of you heard me say this a hundred times, but I'll say it again. The drive-in movie, the drive-in movie experience. It was like we're going to create it, and we'll bring the fans back. We're outdoors. This is safe. They've said it's 99 point something percent safer than being inside. 99 percent, and that if we put people out there as we did, even with masks outside, socially distanced from everyone else, a family or a group of friends comes in, they set their own section of seats, and we were able to get like a thousand fans in and do that for months and months and months. The Jaguars ended up doing the same thing. In the, the first week of NFL 2020, the only two teams had fans in the stands. It was the Jaguars at home and the Chiefs, and uh, so that I think would be the biggest thing because when we came out of the pandemic, we were really ready. Like I said, Punk wasn't here yet, but he was coming. And we came out red hot, and then a bunch of other crazy things happened. And All Out, the end of All Out is one of my, really, All Out is, I think, still, it's our biggest triumph, maybe. But tonight, it was right there with it, and I will see where the numbers settle. But this was a great, the way we started it, not to go full circle to somebody else's question as I keep jumping around, but um, I thought it was the right thing to do to have Punk be, earn the number one contender spot and wrestle his way. Uh, to this position where he had big matches, big matches, and it built and it built and it built. And also he helped a lot of people in that time. A lot of people became better wrestlers and got spotlighted. That's a, t Until tonight, I would say that was the biggest match of Will Hobbs' career. And then he was in a big spotlight on pay-per-view tonight, but those are probably the two. Big and uh, certainly with Garcia, he did so much for him. What, Eddie? Good Lord. And, uh, and, 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 and most importantly for us and the company and the fans. So it built to something really cool. Um, so I, uh, I think the biggest thing I would say, you're, I'm sorry to go, but just thinking about it as I go, probably would be uh, to trust our instincts going into the pandemic that this is going to be safe, don't abandon ship, and I think it paid a big dividends for us. And then even when we had to go in uh, the next week, they wouldn't allow anybody in Daly's Place March 25th. It's, I, if anybody has never heard this story, they only allowed 10 people in the entire amphitheater as a fire. So it was, it was Tony Schiavone at the desk. I was the only person backstage. They said the truck is a separate domicile. So Greg, you were out in the truck. There were 10 of you in the truck. We had a, I set up a trailer of wrestlers to be the crowd since there was nobody at ringside, but at least to get some cheering audio. And then God bless Chris. It was that Chris went out and was like, let's go, let's go, let's go, getting people going like a leader. And he didn't have to be there. Nobody had to be there. It was a very small crew. If you don't know this, I'm, I'm like I'm the guy who robbed a bank and is telling you his secrets. I think people know this by now. Does anybody know from March 25th, Kip and Darby was taped the week before for Dark? People do know that now. Kip and Darby was taped. There was nobody in the building. Nobody knew the difference. So it was completely empty. Cody was on commentary by then with Tony because what I did was, again, you only get 10 people. I couldn't do tag matches. Brandy was uh, doing the, the ring announcing so because they showed up, and these are the people uh, that really showed up for me. And so uh, Kenny and Tony Schiavone were on at the start because then at the end, Kenny and Sammy Guevara were going to wrestle like 28 minutes in an empty building and had a great match for the AAA title. And then at the end was uh, whatever with Matt Hardy and the spoke. I, I was just happy. It was Chris's idea with the thing, like I said, and whatever. I mean, it was a, you know what? The fact Chris and Matt even showed up, I was very thankful. I was going to do whatever. And uh, Sammy coming out from under the ring made a lot of sense and set up stuff that ended up. Then we shut down for a month, and that match that we built there, we didn't get to do until May 6th. But when we did the May 6th TV, it's one of the things I'm the proudest of because we, you know, we were shut down for a month. Then we went to April and we had that crew that showed up. That's when the TNT title became. I'd, all, I'd wanted to do it for a long time. It was a plan, but that was like, okay, now we have to do it because that's all we can do here because like we have to reset everything. 29% of the roster showed up for the tapings in Atlanta. And those, those are the only shows I go back and watch. Those Atlanta ones are literally the only shows I go back and watch. The last one is so good. Uh, for what it was with, uh, you know, opening with uh, Cody Darby and then the crossover match with the best friends versus Havoc and Sabian and the no DQ match and then ending with uh, Dustin and Archer and you know, vi videos and stuff. It was it, like the shows really came together and they kept getting better and better. And also our post-production, I learned so much about post-production and got better, which suited us really well because then we came back going to the Wednesday, Thursday tape cadence with like Wednesday on and then we would tape Thursday and that was really important. And I think also it cut travel down in half. And it did, it saved a little money, but also it also was really good, I think, in the, pan, in the pandemic era, uh, when it was peak pandemic, to have people traveling less. And people were up, we didn't know about planes and things like, so, um, so that was really important. We came back May 6th and then double or nothing come full circle to tonight because that show wasn't here, but I was really proud of that show. That's another, one of the only other pay-per-views I like, I can always go back to watch because it was really special. And a lot of it, I like to go back with Mox and Brody, I think was great. And I think that was like Brody's best, that and the dog collar match were probably Brody's best matches here. It was the best pay-per-view match for sure. And, um, and it was really special. And I called John and I talked to John and Brody in the pandemic, John was gonna come back. He was like, he'd been, he'd been out in April. He wasn't at the April taping, but he was gonna come back in May. And I was telling him we built Brody up 
on this thing. I think that's a really good match. We can get him in the top five. He's like three and zero record, and he can steal the belt. And we do three week build up, and it's like as good as we can do. I think it's gonna be fucking great, dude. You guys are gonna tear the house down, and they did. And then we also set up Taz and Darby that night in May six, which is a program that went like a year, and uh, and set up Jungle Boy versus Max. We set up uh, goddamn uh, you know so many things on that show. But and then we did the of course the. Uh, the, the, the street fight, which is one of my favorite live TV matches that we've done, certainly especially to that point with Kenny and uh, Matt Hardy versus Sammy and Chris, the golf cart, the whole thing, the inner circle's name and lights, and it, it built up to a double or nothing. So yeah, the pandemic era, uh, it, w it was hard for so many re reasons, but I think we came out of it better than ever, so that would be the number one thing. And I think it's like, um, that was what I was talking to Dana about too, because that's what he's proud of stuff too, and he says the same thing, like, uh, and it's very different, and, and, and uh, you, you know, there's, there's different opinions on how we, uh, diff the different things went, but, um, you know, uh, he said that, you know, that for them that was important too, and I think it changed their business, and they did huge numbers by doing shows in April, I think, you know, it ended up being safely, and, uh, and, and they came out of it even stronger too, so that was what he said. Um, does that make sense? It totally does. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. you. But I saw somebody say that the three-way represented the three eras because you saw Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus, the champs from the original era. You had Starks and Hobbs who have come in the pandemic era, and tonight was the first time Starks and Hobbs have lost a tag match in almost two years. Uh, they, the first, they, 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 uh, winner is coming 2020 against Cody and Darby was the last time. And they hadn't That was their first tag match. They haven't dropped one since. They've been dominant, and they beat Keith and Swerve. Three days. Was that? 543 days. Is that after Ramp Rampage was 541, right? And that's 543 now? Yeah. Yeah, because I think I remember them saying 541 on Rampage, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's been, you know, it's, it's been... I gave him that stat, by the way. Oh, did you? Well, there you go. So you did see, so and you, so the, the three eras of AEW, the, you know, to have, like I was starting to say, so, uh, and I, I and it, it's the thought I was giving and talking about those guys and how great they did, but it's the three, you know, the, 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 the original with Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus who were on the very first show here, and then have now worked their way to the top in, in California guys, like you said, and then to have Starks and Hobbs who were, came in the pandemic, both of them, in different circumstances, but came together and, and uh, in cool ways, both of them. Starks on TV is a guy that was a pushed indie guy and that got a great opportunity and seized it. And then I was in the ring and we didn't know, I, he got, it was a tryout match basically, he was in the ring and I said, I, I texted Mox and I was like, I got the guy. For what we want to do, I got the guy. Uh, for, and then he'd never met him or her, and it was John, John fucking saw it. And, like, and then Hobbs was on Dark and uh and you know killing it and i remember i needed somebody i wanted somebody big to wrestle darby on the show where um i think it was saturday night dynamite where brody won the title pretty sure and it was hobbs versus darby and you know wanted somebody to big who big to be credible you don't want some somebody you don't think is credible to be out there manhandling one of your top young stars and he did but obviously darby came from underneath as he's as he's known to do and he's, he's very uh he persevered and but it showed a lot about Will to me. And then All Out was not long later and he went the distance in the Battle Royal and then, you know, saved John with a chair up on the stage when we were socially distanced with the fans and Starks jumped him. So they, you know, they, they were really important. And then getting to- California too. too. Yep, there you go. There you go, California, another California wrestler, Will Hobbs, that's a great point. And then, uh, of course, with Swerve and Keith representing the post-pandemic era, two wrestlers that have come in. So you had the, the, the originals versus the pandemic era versus the post-pandemic era and the three-way. I thought it was really cool. I, and I guess subconsciously I kind of thought about it, but I feel like when somebody said it like that, I was like, that's so cool. Going into the show, it made me feel even better about it. And, and the three-way match they had, the singles match was great, and then you could tell people really wanted the three big guys. So it was just a cool dynamic. Um, so there was a lot of great stuff on the show, but it, it's going to California. Like you said, Hobbs is another great one. The Young Bucks, I think, is a great example. Scorpio Sky, um, and you know, certainly a bunch of great examples um, on the show, top to bottom. And um, you know, you just named a bunch of good ones. So uh, yeah, I, I think it's really important going into LA. Um, having the LA Times here is nice, and uh, a lot of great California journalists like like Dave, who used to write the California Wrestling Report. <laughs> uh, it was before I was born, and uh, and uh, but I'm. Before everyone in this room was born. I don't know about that. I'm looking around the room, uh, but uh, <laughs> but it's a pretty cool fact. And so uh, there's a lot. I think it's just cool for us to go into LA and to go into the forum, and also, frankly, to have the presence of the new, the new management of. Warner Brothers Discovery, the new bosses at TNT and TBS, and it's like so cool. They're, the throwing is a big party, and like that's a really cool thing for them to do, and 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 for them to come to our show, it means a lot. And uh, I'm just so excited about the future there. That's so cool.
So thank you. I'm excited about California. Thanks. Thanks for, coming. Thanks for asking. Okay, guys, really just I'll give a few more. Has anybody not gotten to ask a question all night? Oh, I guess. Oh, Dave's asked 17 questions. Yeah. But you can ask. All right, but I'll get you. What, what, okay. what's, I want to get everybody, and then I'll ask Dave. Uh, Eric from uh, PWInsider.com. Yes. Um, when Four Might Eight did shows, uh, cutting something like the Casino Battle Royal that had been on previous Double or Nothing, is that hard to not have on a show to get more wrestlers on? Well, it might would arguably get more wrestlers on, but I don't think it would spotlight people as much. And it's a longer match. Historically, a lot of entrances, and you talk about a match that could burn the crowd out on a night where we're trying not to do that. I mean, that's like, a, you know, doing 21 entrances isn't necessarily the way to go. Also, I didn't want to have somebody come out. The winner of the match could tip what was going to happen in the main event. And I didn't think the winner, I mean, there could have been somebody that would have been a good matchup for either person. I also thought it was probably better to have Darby and Kyle do a great match of the length they did, which is just a kick-ass hot match versus sticking them in with 19 other people or anybody else. And the mixed trios wouldn't have made sense there. And the other matches on the card, I think all were in good spots. You know, the Death Triangle and the House of Black, I think with Phoenix coming back, they deserved a really good trios match. They kicked ass. Um, versus like jamming the six of them in there with Darby and Kyle and a bunch of people. Talking. So on All Out 2020, I didn't have the extra pay-per-view. And all, another reason why, I, did Nick leave? Uh, so I, I burned Nick out. Nick, another reason for the length of the show. I gave Martha as much time as she wanted to talk. And I told Martha, you can talk as long as you want to talk. And that could have been an hour. And we could have been here. So I extended the pay-per-view window also, not knowing about the Heat Celtics, even in case, because I knew Martha had his, and, and she's such an intelligent, eloquent woman, Dr. Martha Hart. And I wanted to, I, I knew we could have a great moment. And she wanted to. I wasn't going to force her out there to talk. I said, we can show you, you know, if you want to do a promo, she really wanted to. She, I didn't know she wanted me to come with her until, like, literally Brit's music was playing and she'd won the thing and the crowd was chanting DMD after the Owen Hart uh, victory roll reverse variation, which is great. By the way, I thought uh, Dax worked with, uh, Brit and had coached Brit and Ruby and, and I thought he did a great job and and then Dax and we didn't see Dax and, and uh, Cash until the end and talk about Supercard of Honor I mean they're a huge part of Ring of Honor and a huge part of AEW they've been a big part of some of the TVs but there was a lot of stuff on the pay-per-view they understood I didn't want to jam them into a situation they you know they could have worked a tag match but again um, there was already a lot on the show and I think Dax saw a great you know first of all the Supercard of Honor who knows what's going to happen going forward? The pay big pay per views coming, Forbidden Door all out, the future of Ring of Honor. So there's a lot of great opportunities, and also Dax was great working with Britt and Ruby, and uh, and uh, and then um, at the end it was a really nice moment with uh, with them with Punk, I think. So uh, yeah, I, I uh, that's kind of what I was thinking. Uh, but yeah, so so Nick, um, to your your point. Um, that's another thing. No, it's okay. It's a, it's a great point. And you're asking about the length. That was another thing when I did the length. Before I knew about Game 7, another thing I was considering, I was like, maybe I should extend the window because, gosh, Martha, my, it could be 20-minute applause. And it ended up being very long. And she, but I could have let her talk all night if she wanted to. She, and I did. I said, "Stay, Martha, you literally can talk as long as you want. We have the window. We had the time. And, you know, uh, within 30, I mean, even if it had been 30 minutes, we probably would have been okay technically. So, um, it, and I wouldn't have stopped her. So um, that was another thing going in that I was considering. So when I first started to look at the window, that was one of my considerations was we got Martha Hart, Dr. Martha Hart, and her family, Oj Hart and Athena Hart, is a big deal. And um, I didn't want to have to rush that. And I also then, as game seven, I was like, okay, there's a lot of reasons why I can play with the format, do something different than I've ever done, give the same amount of bell-to-bell, -bell, buy-in plus revolution, one more match, but I bet the match time was very similar overall. And uh, there were probably some longer matches there were only a couple matches. Were there only two matches that went 20 minutes tonight? Only the or Anarchy in the Arena and the main event, right? Yeah, because House of Black was 15. There were a bunch of like yeah. great, hot, 12, 15 minute matches yeah. on this pay-per-view. Yeah. 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 And it was different, which is different pacing, and I think it was cool. And like, I think that was one thing people liked about the Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Like Swerve and Alexander had a great like 13, 14 minute opener. There were some, you know, Jay Lethal and Lee Moriarty was probably that length. And there were only a couple, same with the Ring of Honor pay per view, right? There were only a couple really long matches like Dax and Cash versus the Briscoes. And uh, and then the main event were probably the only ones that went that length there, too. So that was, a, and it was different playing with a three hour window. Um, man, it was, it was, and it was a crazy uh, story. I think, did I, I, on your podcast, did I give you the exclusive about the, listen to Andreas's podcast. I gave him the exclusive about the Samoa Joe story. It was one of the craziest. If people hadn't heard the travel story, you remember, you were there. 
I was there, yeah. It was nuts. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I, when I saw Samoa Joe coming through, I was just like, what? What's happening? But up really to cool. that day, we were running around like crazy yeah. because, and I had to, if people don't know, I'll tell you. Well, I'm going to say that I don't want to say he's getting the exclusive and blow the whole story, but it's a good story. It was a crazy, uh, it was a, a travel miracle and the miracle of private aviation and uh, some really cool pilots <laughs> who thankfully um, helped me out on their day off. Um, what else? Uh, any more before we go? Uh, Emily in the back has a question. She's asked you that. Hi, I'm so sorry. Hi. May with the Sportster, and CM Punk earlier today, uh, this evening, mentioned uh, some New Japan talent that he could potentially face in the ring. And so, Forbidden Door is coming up June 26th. There's a lot of talk about this collaboration between AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling. What can fans expect uh, leading up to June 26th? Fans can expect a great event on June 26th. I've been talking to Ghetto and his office extensively and it's like a Crimson Tide situation. I was just reading this book about uh, Don Simpson. Uh, I, don't, you know, I don't get much time to read, but like when the Wi-Fi is off on the plane, like uh, going up and down every day, I usually get a little bit to read up and down the ascent and descent. So I was reading a book called High Concept about this, just what a weird, uh, strange life Don Simpson led and, uh, and just uh, these bizarre, bizarre stories. And, uh, but it was a book I was reading. And uh, so as I was uh, thinking about this, and it's funny that you, uh, that you asked me, it was like uh, he, wrote, he uh, produced a movie called, right before he passed away, called Crimson Tide. And uh, Denzel Washington and Gene Hackman, they both have missile keys to turn these in. It's a very different situation. But think of it like Ghetto and I both have a missile key. Like we're both going to try and figure, I'm not going to try and force anything on him. He's not going to force anything on me. It's been a really good relationship the last year plus, over a year that we've been doing matches and stuff together ever since we reunited Rapungi Vice on AEW Elevation and it brought the Vice back uh, with Rocky and Trent and then uh, have had Nagata come in and wrestle Mox, like I said, which was a real coup for us at the time and all the great matches we've done since. Uh, there's going to be some awesome stuff. So uh, June 26th at the United Center, expect an awesome Forbidden Door pay-per-view. Uh, we've, we've always great, great pay-per-views in New Japan, have great stars and great wrestling and I think they'll come together and it'll be something really special. I'm not at this time planning to do this length of pay-per-view, Nick. Uh, uh, even though it'll be shorter than a Wrestle Kingdom, it'll. I like you, Nick. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Because you set the expectation in 2019 for fans that you weren't going to do five-hour shows. I didn't do a five. It wasn't. It was 4:37, and then. We've been sitting here a long time. You're still enjoying it. Clearly, I see a smile on your face. You're having a good time. In 2019, before I knew there was a Game 7 tonight or that Martha Hart was going to be doing a promo three years later. I had no idea Dr. Martha Hart would ever come to a promo on the show. And God, I budgeted as much time as she needed. So there's 20 minutes of wrestling. I Three years ago, I didn't know that. So it's like, you know, you're, you're holding me to quotes from a long time ago. But in a good way, I, you're holding me accountable, Nick. And that's why you're great at what you do. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in your hometown of Chicago for the Forbidden Door. Well, it's one of my five hometowns. I have two. <laughs> What's your other one? Uh, I'm from Houston. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, good. Well, Houston, you and I do not have a problem. Thanks. We're good. Uh, so, uh, what? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, like, yeah. Okay, good. I'm glad. Uh, but the Forbidden Door, uh, expect in Los Angeles, uh, some, we'll get this thing going. You already saw, by the way, I'm sorry to, uh, uh, which I'm not, Wrestle Kingdom's off and along. Are you, have you seen, ever seen Wrestle Kingdom? You watch Wrestle Kingdom? Okay, great. Okay. So, a lot of people, because a lot of people in my company won't watch New Japan. And I'm a big New Japan fan. I'm, there's a, I bet, show a hands of who watches New Japan in here. Oh, Brian, you don't watch New Japan? You full of shit? Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, okay, so a lot of people in here watch New Japan. A lot of our fans probably haven't seen it, I'm gonna bet. So they're gonna get, mo they, they've seen some of the stars. I think we've already had great wrestlers, some of the ones I mentioned. Ishii's been with us a few times and, and, and is great. So, uh, it look, like this is a more educated room than, than probably most wrestling rooms you're gonna get of fans. So I think we probably know more about some of these stars. We're gonna have to debut some of them on TV. It was cool to see Great O'Conn and Jeff Cobb. Jeff Cobb he had been gone for over two years, right? Over two years. And uh, so um, I, I really liked it, uh, you know, the way they came in. And uh, obviously it did 
you know, uh, leave things open-ended. I thought FTR and Rapungi Vice were having a great match. Rapungi Vice had tried to win the Ring of Honor belts for a long time. They won a lot of big matches. They beat the Young Bucks in Ring of Honor. They won a lot of matches there. So uh, I think they said this was like their fourth shot at the title. And uh, it, they didn't really get a fair one. And they were having a really good match, and those guys came in and busted it up. So it sets up interesting things not only with AEW New Japan, but also potentially with Ring of Honor and New Japan, who obviously have a lot of history together. And it partnered. Was anybody at their Madison Square Garden show here? People, a lot of people were, and yeah, that was, I think, one of the most successful shows Ring of Honor had done, and also a big debut at, at uh, New Japan here. So I think we can, I think we can do a better show. And that was, a, you know, I think they did a great sellout, a great crowd. I think we can do a better show than that, and have more involvement from big stars from New Japan, and also have, frankly, from the American side, even more star representation than that show had, which was a big success. This will be even bigger, and in line with what you've come to expect from AEW events, also New Japan. I won't beat Nick up about the show length question because it's a very fair question. But I think I will try to. It probably won't be the same thing on June 26th. I don't think the sports competitions there. What? I'm kidding. Just keep going. Back. But in a good way, in a loving way, and. Uh, well, that's true. And then Dave brought up that he wrote for WWE, so we're just having a good time here. We're scatting. I didn't and. You did, I think. Well, you brought up uh, what they do backstage, which I think you're familiar with because you used to write that. <laughs> yes, I'm making that. <laughs> okay, are we having a good time? All right. Anybody? All right, thank you. I'm sorry. That, uh, hey, thanks. New Japan. Let's go. Uh, I've been watching it for 31 uh, years. The first, first WCW pay-per-view I ever watched, which I watched 100 times. It was 14 matches. Everyone, if Super Brawl won, Nick, uh, Super Brawl won, I've watched it a hundred times, and the main event is Fujinami versus Flair, and it wasn't, but then I went back after the live pay-per-view, I had to see the match before, and I watched the pay-per-view they did, which was a WCW New Japan pay-per-view in Japan, which was a great pay-per-view. I thought the Flair Fujinami match there was probably better, and uh, I thought the Hase and Sasaki versus the Steiners is one of the best matches ever in WCW, and hopefully we can have that kind of same high standard that they set with that WCW show there. Again, uh, was it uh, Akira Nogami versus Liger? Yes. And then Arn and Barry Windham wrestled Saito, and... Oh, man. I remember they hit that, Arn ducked and, and Barry hit the Larry. Yeah, the big, it might have been the big guys. It was a great show, and uh, that I think we can hopefully now it's been, that's been over 30 years, and that would be the standard I would love to live up to. Starcade 95 had some good stuff, but it wasn't just about that. Uh, New Japan versus WCW, they had the best of seven, which is real cool, but then also there was, um, you know, the three way for the world title, and, you know, Flair and, and Sting, and uh, Lex, and then Macho Man. So there was a lot of non New Japan story. This will be, uh, I think it will, it'll be good. It'll be true to AEW, true to New Japan. Thanks for asking. The match was, uh, was uh, Arden Barry versus uh, Asaido and Chono. Thank you, Saito and Chono. Chono. Thanks, of course. Yeah, and of course, and then I learned about Chono being the protege of Luthez, who we talk about wrestling online. People are like, remember when you couldn't go online and hear from us? I talked to, to when I, 1995, I was 12 years old. I would have regular conversations with Brian Pillman Sr., DDP, who's my friend now, and the late Luthez when he was writing the book Hooker and told me a lot. He told me Bill Watts used to carry a gun around, actually, uh, when I was 12 years old and I was a big fan of Mid-South Wrestling. Uh, and he was like, yeah, Bill, Bill Watts wouldn't put up with any shit. He had a gun. No, I, I, trust me, I do, I do not. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and uh, I learned a lot from those experiences and I think the online wrestling community has been a thing a lot longer than people realize. So uh, with that, it's been a great time. Who is anybody have anything that I have, I have anybody I didn't talk to that came all the way to, wants to ask a question? I, yes, please. Uh, sure, you too. Yes, I saw you. Yes, sir. Well, give Phil, Phil. Let Phil go first. Thanks, Phil. Hey, uh, Phil Lindy, Bleacher Report. Hey, Phil. Um, so, of course, the uh, Athena debut tonight. Um, I know some people want to see her debut as a Joker, so I just wanted to ask, like, how long did you know she was signing, and, you know, what went into making a decision to do a signing? Thank you for asking. Really appreciate it. Um, I thought that it would be a great debut. I'd love to have big pay-per-view debuts in different circumstances. Like, you know, obviously, um, the way Brian Danielson and Adam Cole debuted, it was a very different circumstance in some ways, but on the other hand, when Stokely became available, it was like, I can take one big debut and get two debuts across in one thing, but I didn't know he was coming. I knew she was. And there was a situation that was, I thought was a clear, if, starting with Jade Nana, which I thought, you know, uh, the, the Jade's, uh, uh, you know, best TV match probably is still, I think, Jade versus Anna on the Rampage in DC in the main event. And so I thought it would be a really fitting rematch, but also set up many matches down the line. And I, I thought at the end it would be really cool if you had 
uh, Statlander come back. And originally I wasn't planning for Statlander to be, to be in the tournament, but she did a great job as a substitute. Had an awesome match on Rampage a couple weeks ago with Red Velvet, and then another awesome match with Ruby. And clearly the crowd was really <coughs> behind her, but I already knew that I thought this would be a great spot to set up Athena debuting a three-on-three -three kind of standoff with the baddies, Jade, Red Velvet, and Kira Hogan uh, squaring off against Anna J. After a match, Chris Statlander came out, faced off everybody. She was ready to take on all of them, and she, Red Velvet, she's got a real axe to grind with, not just because of their long friendship and the way Red Velvet stabbed. Are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm good. Okay, good. Uh, and then uh, the way uh, Red Velvet kind of stabbed uh, her in the back after she got caught in the thing with Layla, and it's really unfortunate what happened with Layla and the injury because she was really rolling. I thought our last pay-per-view, the first match of the show, the buy-in, they kicked ass. And so... Um, I really appreciate you asking that because I think it's a really good thing to do. I was really excited to have Athena debut here and I didn't th necessarily think it would make as much sense as the Joker because the Joker was Britt Baker's opponent and of course now we saw Britt Baker, great, I think it was a great moment and to crown a, a, a king and a queen uh, with the, the original Queen of Hearts, the all-time Queen of Hearts, the, the, the real Queen, you know, Martha Hart, Dr. Martha Hart. So I thought it would be really cool to have Athena debut in that context across from the baddies. I didn't know Stoke was coming until today. I'd never, like I said, I'd never met him or talked to him, but it worked out perfect. And I had, in the back of my mind, if it did work out, I thought that would be a cool scene, but I wasn't, really didn't know, and I thought we could have brought him in later. But it, if, you, you know, if, if he wanted to come, but he was definitely somebody I had in mind. It was cool to have him come in and have it work out like that today, though. It was good, to, hell, of a, hell of a lucky break for us. So, uh, is that, is that, does that make sense? Yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, I think that's a wrap. Great. Oh, is it, do you have wait, one more? This is my last one. This is my last one. Okay, well, Tony, th obviously, thank you for your time. Thank you for doing this. And let's give a round of applause for everybody in the yard. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, I hope everyone had a good experience taping this for the first time. And I tried, I heard that was bad for you, and a bunch of you like said that sucked. So I tried to make it so you could. So I hope it worked out. Thank you for being accommodating. Sure. Uh, I wanted to ask you something that you mentioned a few weeks ago back on an AEW show on March 23rd in Austin. So I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, so feel free to correct me if you want to. But uh, you came out and you had mentioned how special and important the city of Boston was to you. And you had mentioned something about how vital South by Southwest was to you as far as the formation of the a uh, AEW. So I wanted to ask you, like, what about the event like gave you the inspiration of like forming the company potentially and like another question about South by Southwest. If you're a fan of it, would AEW post anything there? Oh man, did Raph, do we lose? Oh, he's right there. Hey, we never know. We have a great crowds there. Every time we've gone, they've been really hot. So to start with, they've been they've been great every time we went. They were, we went back there. That was our second show back on the road and it was Fighter Fest night one. The Darby, you were there? That's awesome. Darby, Ethan Page, the coffin match was a great match and a great night. And uh, so thank you for asking. It's a great question, and I'll give you a, 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 the last of my long answers, and hopefully, but it's a memorable one. And it relates to somebody you know. I don't know if you know this story, uh, Dave. So um, first of all, Austin, Texas. I, it was a true story. I told CM Punk, um, was it CM Punk dust? What was it? The uh, match in Austin that uh, CM Punk it wrestled. It was CM Punk and Dax. Recently. Dax, that's right. So I told Punk. This is one of the best crowds we have. And I went and told the crowd right before, if you remember, I was like, I have a friend in the back and I told him this is one of the best crowds we have and he's about to come out here. And then you all started chanting CM Punk, CM Punk. And it was about as perfect as a crowd warm up can go. Cause I didn't even say anything and you guys started chanting it. And then it was what I wanted. And then the show went live and the show, and 1.2 million people were watching me right then. And it was like CM Punk, CM Punk, CM Punk. So you guys were, you did, you were awesome. Again and again and again, you always have been. You, one of the best dynamites we ever did was, uh, two weeks before, three weeks before Revolution. I actually flew, yeah, it was great. I didn't know you guys had a direct flight to London, I learned. I flew out to London uh, on uh, British Airways and then flew back to Atlanta for the, one of the, another one of the best dynamites ever. And uh, South by Southwest, I was on a panel with some of the most distinguished people in pro sports and just sports media and my, so by the CEO of my company was moderating and there were people up there that included Nate Silver and Daryl Morey, who was a friend and a mentor to me and he was the GM of the Rockets at the time. and. Uh, he was, uh, he's now the GM of this Philadelphia 76ers. He's a really smart person. He's always been very nice to me. Um, and uh, now that he doesn't have Ben, Ben Simmons on the nets now, right? Yep. So right when now. they, I, I edited it off the show and Ben Simmons got booed. <laughs> <laughs> I told him I would. He said, I heard Ben, he, there was a Ben, he texted me. He's like, I heard there was a Ben Simmons thing on the show. And I was like, don't worry, Daryl. It won't, there won't be on Friday. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, um, and uh, so I was on there with Daryl and Nate Silver and Rafe Anderson, the CEO of True Media uh, and the founder and um, co-founder along with Jeff Stern. 
and uh, Jeff Stern and Rafe Anderson. So they were, they were uh, on stage with me and I saw Chris Nowinski in the back. And Chris asked me a question about safety and, and, and has now worked with the NFL and got to know him better. But he asked me a question and that's how I first got to know Chris. He asked me a question with a, at this big panel of guys and I saw in the back, it was like back where Greg's sitting back there with more people in the room. And it was at a private event, uh, Jim, uh, the Raptor House. Uh, Jim, Jim, uh, does anybody know uh, from Boston uh, sports? This is pathetic. Raph, you might know. Jim, uh, the Raptor House. Uh, uh, Roma, AC Roma. Jim, uh, uh, what a great guy. Uh, that's pathetic of me. I'm sorry, it's so late, guys. Uh, he invited me, and uh, Nowinski was in the back, and then I talked to him after, and we built a real lasting friendship, and, uh, and that was kind of the first person I ever knew that I watched on TV as a pro wrestler that, like, I met in person because, like I said, I talked to Pillman, DDP, Luthez, different people online, and they were really nice. DDP gave me tickets to a nitro I couldn't use because I was a kid and I had school, and I don't live in—I didn't live in Florida back then. And uh, they were great tickets, and uh, he was, he was, we used to have conversations about like psychology wrestling. I was 12 years old, and the fact that he even like would talk to people. He took fan, fan feedback before people did that, and on Twitter and social media, Instagram, and he did it on AOL dialogue. And, uh, and that's how, and I, that's just probably a morsel of how he got to where he is because of the hard work and that he did beyond what other people did, right? And so with Austin, I was up there and that's how I made the connection with Chris. And then that's how, that, and then it's been such a special town for AEW. And like I told Punk, I said, this is gonna be like one of the greatest things. And I told the crowd, and you guys made it. You made it, you were great for Punk and Dax. Thank, I, what a, they were 52 weeks of the road on the year. Sometimes I, I do forget things. But that was one of the best matches we've had on TV and one of the best moments. So you guys have been great. And that was the kind of uh, formative moment for me in the wrestling business in 2000, early 2014, right? That would be like February, March, February. And then, um, and then it, the 2018, I was in a position four years later to, to have a conversation um, with the president of TNT and TBS that probably led to the, more so than anything else, the creation of the company. So um, that's, I love Austin, thank you. Now, would, are, would you consider hosting events in South by because there's a lot of music, a lot of films going on? We should look at that, maybe maybe there's something there, maybe, and, and it may not even have to be the TV, it could be something else, you know, there could be shows, that's something I've looked at, is uh, how to expand our portfolio of events, because we have a great roster and all over the country, different places, That's a, there could be something there, sure, we haven't really gotten that far. I mean, you've got a logo on the roster that's pretty good that you probably utilize, right? Who's that, Swerve? Yeah. Yeah. He's great. I think we can all agree about that. Uh, he's, he'd be tremendous. He is a, an entertainment mogul. We have a couple moguls. I think there's a few musicians, and uh, he would be above all else. So, um, absolutely. You know, Chris, obviously, a pretty prominent musician, too, who's charted, and um, Brody King, but obviously, Swerve is a mogul. So, uh, they, those, are, those would be great choices. We could totally. And Max Caster, by the way. <laughs> Yo. Listen. <laughs> Yo. Uh, all right, well, uh, it's been a great uh, night. Uh, and with that, I think uh, I've kept you long enough. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, seriously, thank you. Thank you, everyone.